It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome the firm Wallalu Choi um, and uh, introduce uh, Tariq Wallalu and Lina Choi. Um, their firm was founded uh, as an uh, architectural and urban design practice that has offices both in France and Morocco, which is a, a wonderful place to go between. Um, Lina, who's originally from Seoul, South Korea, is a graduate of both Yale and Harvard GSD. She's a licensed architect, architect here in the state of New York and has served as a vis visiting architectural critic at various design schools, notably the Rhode Island School of Design and MIT, amongst others. Uh, as a design principal, she manages the Paris-based team currently working on projects both in Europe and in Africa. Tariq is originally from Rabat, Morocco, and is a graduate of Paris Malaké School of Architecture and the Rhode Island School of Design. In addition, he holds degrees in art and architectural history from the Ecole du Louvre and in engineering from the Ecole Nationale des Arts et Métiers in Paris. Um, he is the recipient of numerous of awards and uh, has also taught, uh, along with Lina, uh, and, and uh, many prestigious schools, including, of course, MIT, but also uh, Rice and uh, the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture. Uh, with Lina, he directs the office's ongoing work in both Paris and Casablanca at the studio there, uh, overseeing projects such as the development of a new city of Mazagan in Morocco, the cultural center of Morocco in Paris, the Maison de l'Afrique outside of France, and two mixed-use projects in Brussels. Um, also exciting is that the studio released a monograph, which is uh, for sale back there, so um, a bit of a book launch. Um, but I'd just like to say on a personal note, uh, this is uh, really an exciting young firm. We'll keep them young for a long time, because that's the luxury of, of architecture. Um, I got to know them a bit uh, 10 years ago uh, through Jean-Louis Cohen, a common acquaintance when uh, we collaborated on a series of architecture in Morocco for the Alliance Francaise. And it was very uh, impressive to hear this uh, then even younger firm uh, address uh, issues of, of architecture in Morocco and working between uh, Paris and, and Morocco. So, I'm thrilled just to see what they've been up to. Uh, so with that, I would welcome uh, Tariq to uh, talk with you, and I know that Lena's gonna join him for questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ben, for this very kind uh, introduction, and thank you guys for being here. Um, Lina is having me do this, um, and hopefully she'll join me for the Q&A, but we're especially happy to be here. Um, ben explained this. I was born and raised in Morocco. Lina was born in Seoul, raised in California. We met in New York, uh, as it would be obvious, about uh, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, and we've embarked on a crazy journey since. I'm going to show you some of the work we do at the office, but... I'm not gonna go through the projects and describe them. I wanna mostly tell you why we do this and uh, more than how we do it. Architecture as a discipline is stuck in the myth of amelioration. We are all supposed to better the situation where we inject ourselves. The problem is that architecture is also producing in and for a system that is profoundly toxic. It is killing the only planet we have. And this is not a metaphor. Architecture as a practice is part of the deterioration of our environment. It is also producing fabric, urban spaces that make almost impossible the public form of our tribes and communities. It is also making spaces where the body disappears. So we're stuck in the strong contradiction between on one hand our ontological goals of amelioration, and on the other, the fact that everything that we do makes the situations worse. I use this mostly in France because I like to remind them of their recent history, but this is exactly what we do. As architects, we are the worst kind of collaborator. We are. 
And hopefully we'll be able to discuss that later. And I often use Einstein's definition of madness. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And as we're considering it, Lina and I, is that we have to invent a completely new way of doing things. And that's the reason why we propose a form of resistance. And for us, the resistance is a simple thing. It's redefining the notions that we use to do architecture. The conversation of architecture is extraordinarily um, void, vacant, um, undetermined. Issues like context, program, site, sustainable development, all these issues are actually uh, empty suitcases that we carry around the world thinking that they mean something. Nobody else outside of the profession thinks that they mean something. And what we try to do is um, invent completely new platform, new ways of doing our work. So let's start with this. I'm gonna go through a series of themes and some of them will explain the work and we'll try to define new notions to, to do this work. The reason why we do this is because we are profoundly convinced that we are definitely the last generation of humans to live the way we are living now. And we all are going to have to imagine in a radical new way how we're going to create uh, human settlements. We have to fabricate a form of modern project of survival. It sounds a little bit dramatic, and it absolutely is. Because if you don't think that we have to completely change the way we do things, um, then I don't know, but then you won't understand what we're saying today. So let's start with this. The notion of context is fairly new in architecture. It's, it has about 50 or 60 years. It didn't, you didn't have to have a context. You just had to be part of a situation to do the work. You had understood the codes, you had empathy, and you were working in an ecosystem where most of the values were understood. As soon as the notion of context starts to exist, then you, you have to use it to carry uh, how you do the work in places you don't understand. So context becomes things you pick up in an airport lounge. It becomes a pattern you put on a facade. It becomes a very superficial and most of the time insulting understanding of the cultures in which you work. So the context is the suitcase of the star architect that goes everywhere. What we advocate is the notion of familiarity, where instead of looking at things from the outside and contextualize it, we work very hard at being familiar with the situation we're in, whether we know them or not. And that means um, giving a little bit of ourselves in the projects we build. I like to give a metaphor about this. In the um, early 20th century with the French colonization. Before they built cities, they actually brought gardens. And they brought plants from all over the empire and put them wherever they went. And this notion of acclimatization, of taking something from one place and putting it somewhere else, and see how we'd mutate, how we would transform, how we would die or thrive, is actually what we're doing. And it happened in modern architecture. And this notion of graft and acclimatization of modern architecture gave uh, in the 50s and 60s, modern architecture second breath. This is in Brazil, but it was also the case in Morocco. And this notion that we have to work with the endogen elements and things from the outside, but mostly inscribe ourselves in situation, uh, makes it difficult to look at buildings like this. Um, I'm a big fan of Jean Nouvel. He's one of my last bosses, and I have a tremendous uh, respect for him. And this building is actually not bad, but it started an entire generation of buildings all over the world where all you had to do is define a skin, a pattern, that, that form of easy symbolism. In this case, for example, in the Institut du Monde Arabe, the pattern used on the facade is actually Ottoman, so it has nothing to do with the Arab world. Uh, but now you see this building all over the world. Uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we were asked to do a building in front of uh, l'Institut du Monde Arabe. It was a tent for a temporary exhibition. And obviously the tent is a strong Moroccan theme. And we were asked to do it because it was an exhibition on contemporary Morocco. We didn't want to bring in a notion of folklore in this. What interested us were two things. One, the tent is a universal figure. 
you have the yurt in Mongolia, you have the tipi in the Amerindian culture, you have the tents everywhere. So what we wanted to do is tap into this universal notion and fabricate something that is not a traditional figure, but mostly a landscape, something that starts from the ground. So what we did is simply organize the conversation between two buildings that don't look at each other. On the one hand, Jussieu, here, um, which is a building uh, built in the 60s, right across from l'Institut du Monde Arabe, and on the other, um, Lima. I'm, I'm just gonna show this picture quickly because there's an anecdote that says everything about uh, this building. Jean Nouvel, who's very close to this building, uh, came to the opening and sat exactly where you are here. And, you know, I, I went to go see him, a little bit scared, you know, and talk to him, comment ça va, and he looks at it, and he's like, you know what, my building is very nice. <laughs> um, the interesting part of this is that sometimes architecture isn't made to stay, and here it created the notion that two things that never looked at each other had a new frame for it. And since then, the Parvis had had a new life of uh, uh, these temporal architectural bases. The interesting part was we worked with a fabric that's been made in the desert of Morocco by women for a thousand of years, and it's made of a wool of um, hair of camel and a hair of goat. And we had these uh, women work over the summer with uh, French uh, alpinists, you know, to put it together. And it's interesting to see that even without talking the language or understanding how the building was put together, they managed to work on it. And it was a very moving process. Another notion of familiarity. We are working on um, a large hotel project in Morocco. And what we wanted to do for, the, for this uh, project is to revisit the notion of the courtyard, which is such a overrun theme. And in this, in this case, uh, what we did was create not a single building with a corridor and a bedroom to the left and bedroom to the right, but a fabric of articulated small buildings that had both a very strong interiority, but that projected all the public spaces on the outside. So there was a small interior sanctuaryized garden, and in order to activate the entire street, we put on the ground of all of these buildings all the public elements of the hotel. So from the reception, to the hotel, to the bar, to the spa, to the convention. So all of a sudden, the street was completely activated and the interiority is what created a threshold between the outside and the inside. At the same time that we do this, the courtyard doesn't mean you don't have a relationship to the outside. And here, in order to create that relationship, we wanted to transform the relationship of the wall to a column by working simple, transformation of rhythm. In this case, all the buildings have different um, axes and rhythms and each column thickens by seven centimeters from one to the next, creating moments of great fragility and moments of, of a much uh, stronger porosity. I'll stay with this notion because we're working right now on a museum project for a uh, collection, collectioner, collector, okay. And museums for collector are always a very private story because it's based on their personal uh, taste, their personal history. In this case, she's been collecting for 50 years. And this notion of accumulation of, there is no scientific understanding of the collection if it's not about talking about the person herself. So we couldn't build a museum in a traditional sense of the term. We had to find um, different apparatuses so to keep almost a domestic ways of stacking things. I showed the uh, drawings of the Stone Museum and the interior of the Stone because for me it's the ultimate collector's home. Uh, but you have to imagine that on the one hand you have the Stone and on the other hand you have the Moroccan tradition of piling shit up. Um, <laughs> And we had to work with these two things. So what we did is to propose a very, very small building that worked like a giant city. We created a multitude of rooms that we stacked on top of each other to allow her to transform the museography and the scenography at will in a situation that will work um, with a single nave and a series of chapel that would stack differently and allow her to transform it. So whether it's the the theme of the materiality for the tent, the reinvention of the courtyard, relooking at the traditional Medina, we consider that familiarity means creating new things 
that are plausible. New things where people can project their imaginary, where they don't feel lost immediately, and that uh, you give them a little bit of the ball of yarn to start unraveling the story. There's one thing we never talk about in the office. It's the notion of program. Program is the worst thing that happened to the realm of architecture in the past 30 years. Um, started with Rem and with all of his minions. Now it seems that an architectural project is simply the computation of extruded boxes of program. We don't even talk about usage. And that means that we only do one thing at a time. A building that is so programmed, so specific, is a building that is obsolete even before it's finished. Even before you've finished construction, you don't know what to do with it. And there's one thing that architecture has always done well, is to build architecture with architecture. To, you couldn't imagine the Rome of the 16th century without the marbles of the Forum. And that's what we mean by cannibalization, is to imagine what we can do with architecture on architecture. And I, I like this image because um, this is Luca in the central square. And Obviously, you see the figure of the Roman amphitheater. That's a very powerful resilience of a form, the capacity to build on top of something and give it depth in history. And that's what we like to do. We don't think that program is relevant. We actually fight the notion of program. We like to create zones of indetermination, things that could be used for many things, that can transform during the day, that can transform during the seasons. Um, and I've learned this in Morocco. I'm gonna talk a lot about Africa and Morocco today because I strongly believe that it's in this century and only there that we can reinvent new ways of being humans. The rest of the planet is already very urbanized. We're gonna urbanize rapidly the entire continent. We have the possibility of doing it differently. And what we try to do isn't to adapt what we've done in France and what we've done in the States there. But we try to learn about how they've been doing it and see how that can actually help us transform our way of doing it here. Um, in the 50s, in Morocco, they invented the notion of adapted housing. French architects were imagining how the local population would want to live. And this building, it's called Nida Bay, Beehive, was the cover of L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, it was part of the Team 10 and the reinvention of the modern movement. And this, it's absolutely beautiful. That's what we like about architecture. It's abstract, it's a series of plane, and the idea behind it is extraordinarily generous. It's a series of suspended courtyards. Arabs like courtyards on the ground. We're gonna put courtyards upstairs and it will work. Ben was talking about Jean-Louis Cohen, with whom I've worked uh, since 1995, and he asked me to go photograph this building in 1997 to prepare an exhibition. I had the address, and I went around and around and around, and I couldn't find it. Oh. It looked exactly like this. And this, for me, is as beautiful as the previous image. These countries have the capacity to welcome radical invention, but they also have the capacity to transform them to metabolize them, to digest them, and sometimes to ridiculize them. Can you see that, ridiculize? To, um, and that, for me, is what cannibalization is. I'll talk about a couple of projects, and this is one of the projects that changed our relationship to time. We worked in a series of um, caravanserai. They're old building in the Medina of Fez. The Medina of Fez is a time machine. It started to be built in, in the 10th century, and it's absolutely huge. It's two and a half the size of Venice. And you can only walk through it by foot or on donkeys. So it resists any form of modernization of the city. Um, and we worked in this series of buildings. I'm just gonna show two buildings from the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th century. It just so happened that two of these buildings here, Schmein and Spetrin, were close to each other built 150 years apart, but were not connected at all. And they're defining two completely different neighborhoods in the city. So our intervention was very simple. We decided to rebuild them with using only traditional materials, not a single ounce of concrete or um, acier or steel, 
But we decided to create a connection between them, not only to um, allow for the program or different usage to, to be able to transform them, but also to create a shortcut. In this particular case, these buildings were caravanserai. They used to house um, craftsmanship in the 15th century. Imagine if we were to decide a very differ, defined program. Say we make it a hospital, we make it a museum, and then we try to make the typology follow the function and the usage. Then these buildings will disappear. So our bet is to say we'll rebuild with the typology and allow for all the program to be uncomfortable in them because these buildings were there before us and they'll hopefully be there after us. It was a fascinating uh, construction site um, where the single most important dimension was the time it took for materials to go in and out. Because again, there's only donkeys that can go in and out and only a certain amount of them that can go through the day. So you learn to work very slowly, painfully slowly. And all of a sudden, the relationship between the design time and the construction time changes completely. Um, we show this project because they're important in our way of looking at the world as it is now. Um, they've been finished, it, the construction took almost seven years. Um, but as a result, the program that was given to us has changed seven times um, and will continue changing. Another project of cannibalization is one of the um, project that Lina and I um, like very much. One of our early projects, we were fortunate enough to build the museum in the Roman site of Volubilis, actually not very far from Fez. And Volubilis is an incredible town uh, where you were sent uh, in the early uh, first century AD if you're really, really naughty. Like if you did something really bad, that's where you were sent in exile. Uh, and you understand why when you get there, because it's the end of the known world. That's as Western as you could get. But Romans being Romans, they always settle in the right place. Beautiful wind, the valley's incredible, uh, grapes, uh, wheat, cypresses, I and mean, the landscape is exactly the same as the Roman left it. Nothing has been built around. The fundamental heritage of Volubilis is its landscape. But when we arrived, uh, there was a few constructions that were done here by the French in the 20s. And we were not allowed to, to demolish them, even though they were completely ruined. They were ruined because the Romans, being smarter than the French, built everywhere else, but not here. Here, because the land is unstable, so all those houses were uh, essentially needed to be demolished. It was impossible to propose that, because Volubilis is a World Heritage Protected UNESCO site. And after a year and a half of negotiation with them, um, and with the help of the Minister of Culture, one day we just couldn't take it. The notion that these people were telling us what we should do or not brought a form of very primal anti-colonialism in him. And he said, you know what? We're going to meet them on Tuesday. This was Friday. Let's tear everything down. So we did. We brought in trucks that we paid for ourselves, actually, with Lina. We tore everything down, and we got there on the side with them on Tuesday. We, we got really yelled at. But that allowed us also to start imagining a project where what was important wasn't so much that we want to mimic the Romans. All we did is what we wanted to create, a building that was made with the materials that you could find on site, and that you would make it as a ruin, not as a mimic of ruin, but that you would embed in the building its own disappearance. So we work with concrete, we work with stone, and we work with wood, the only three materials we use in this building. The concrete, we used it to create a dam to stabilize the earth, and we know that's what's going to last the longest. The stone are all the ground, and the wood uh, was used not only uh, to protect the building, but because we had so very little money, we actually used very expensive wood, uh, cedar from the region, to create the formwork um, that you see here. And after we poured the concrete, uh, we just cleaned the wood, let it dry for a year, and then put it back on the facade. And for us, that is a form of cannibalization. You 
take what's there. You, the program doesn't matter. I, you'll never hear me say, this is the museum, and here is an auditorium, and this is the bathroom. It's completely immaterial, because the building is a simple landscape. It's a place you go through. So after we don't talk about program, and we don't talk about context, there's a one thing we never talk about, is sustainable development. And not only we don't talk about it, but we fight it with every ounce in our body. It is the greatest scam, the greatest hypocrisy of our current contemporary practice. Let me put it simply. Sustainable development means let's build buildings that weigh on the earth as little as possible so that we can keep living the way we live. We, it, it's strongly technological. We invented it here and in Europe. But here's the problem. The countries that are deteriorating the climate are the ones who will be affected the furthest by climate change. So we don't need to sustain the way we live. We need to all agree that we have to fundamentally change it. Our relationship to comfort, our relationship to climate, our relationship to the membranes and to each other have to change. And I absolutely refuse the fact that we're gonna push this notion of sustainability so that we push further and further away the moment we here collectively will have to decide to change while half a planet away, people are dying because we're doing this here. I know it's a bit dramatic, but seriously guys, you have to be with me on this one. Um, this is a project that we're doing in the desert by the sea. So you have the worth of both realms. It's extraordinarily harsh and you have very strong salted uh, winds. Um, it's a high school project and it's starting construction now. What we wanted to do, and when, when I talk about building climates, it's literally this. In this particular case, um, there's a very bland and interesting American-made master planning. When I say American-made, it's, it's not about America. It's how it exports itself outside. This could be done anywhere. Uh, but they gave us this little piece of land, which is at the edge of the desert. And what we propose is very simple. We put all the public elements of the high school on the ground, and we put all the classroom suspended 12 meters above so as to protect it. So you go back to an almost primal definition of architecture as shelter. So the classrooms becomes a very thick piece um, of, this is, um, how do you say that in acres? This is about three acres. So it's a, it's a, big, it's a big piece, a very heavy piece that needs to be lifted and that allow to create this completely tropical landscape below. And all of a sudden, the moment of protection isn't about creating public space, it's about creating a new climate between the world below and the world above. And this is something that we do always at the office, and we're very um, obstinate about it. We believe that architecture is the relationship that man create between the ground and the sky. There's always a ground and there's always a sky. And this in particular case is the realm in between that interested us. So that sometimes makes for very dorky looking buildings and not very appeasing from the outside. But we have to allow for that from time to time. Another example of this uh, climate reflection. Um, this is the Crystal Palace. And this is to talk about a building we did in 2015 for the Pavilion at the World Expo in Milan for Morocco. Morocco has been at every single world exhibition since 1867, before the colonial time, during colonial time, and after. And every time, showing the same thing, a very orientalized, very uh, folklorized perception of the country. This is in 1900, this is 1964, which was in New York, which is why I'm showing it. Um, and we were asked to do, I'll go back to this, we were asked to do this pavilion and what we wanted to, to say is just show the world that outside of the folklore, which exists, Morocco is a land of profound invention and radicality. And the theme was uh, nourishing the earth. So the French did something about food and the Americans did something about agriculture. So what did we have left? Morocco and Africa's single contribution 
to this notion of nourishing the planet isn't about just food or agriculture. It's about the notion of rurality, the notion of the countryside. And that is something that's also very powerful in, in, in America. Rurality is the balance with the resource, the balance with society, the balance within the fabric. And what we wanted to do is to show this. And the, the way we did it is to build in Earth, in Adobe, and we've patented a system of a single block. The entire building is made of a single block that's two meter by two meter 40 by 60 centimeter deep uh, of Adobe that's framed in wood. And what was important to us isn't just the form of the building, but is the climate it was creating inside. The building you see here with the module is a simple aggregation of the single element. But what it does is that it has no weather threshold. What you see here, these little cracks, are actually completely open. They're just, uh, there's just rope uh, to break the sun. The notion is that if it was 110 degrees outside, then you would be 85 inside. If it were 40 degrees outside, then it'd be 65 degrees inside. The relationship to the body in its understanding the climate is what will put people in the, in the condition of understanding the, the experience of the country. And that was from the outside and translated inside. So when we talk about building climates, we put the reappropriation of our body at the center of what we do. And that sometimes means putting you in a very uncomfortable position. Comfort leads to suburbia. There's nothing comfortable about Venice, but it's beautiful. As soon as we drop the notion that comfort is a right, then we can start making architecture again. Last year, um, we did the craziest building we ever built. We built the entire village of the COP22 in Marrakech. I don't know if you know what the COP is. It's the yearly meeting of all the leaders of the world to talk about climate change. There was a big one in 2015 in Paris called COP21. It was the first time in the history of this planet that every country agreed on a principle, a single principle. And we're talking about countries that really don't like each other generally. What's fantastic about the COP is that you have, for two weeks, people bury the hatchet, and they're willing to sit together and to understand that we're on the same boat. The problem is that the French took everything away from us. They did it a year before. We were coming the year after that. They had already signed a big paper. So what could we do? It was going to be yet another COP where people are just going to come from all over the world. It was going to cost a huge amount of money for a country that's not that rich. We had to question, in terms of theme, what could we bring? And what we proposed was the following. And that's the power of architecture, by the way, because we were asked to think about this. We weren't told. So the French created a powerful document. But it was a, a political, diplomatic, technocratic document. It was not incarnated. Um, and there's one thing about Africa, and Morocco in particular, is that it's a country of rituals. It's a country where the sacred is still very present. And we thought that bringing a religious, sacred, ritualized dimension so that people would actually understand the technicality of the accord was important. So the way we did that is to build a huge garden, a kilometer and a half long garden under a canopy where we invited all the landscapes of Morocco from the wettest to the driest. And you know, most of these, um, events happen in closed uh, you know, halls and meeting rooms. And our big pride for this is that all of the, the COP happened under the canopy. Um, and the reason why it worked was simply because we created a space where we had no idea what was going to happen, and we brought in a, a utilized uh, landscape as a figure to express this. We didn't explain to people that they were all the plants from Morocco. We just created a possibility for these things to happen. You can't imagine the difficulty of convincing people to do this where they're just asked to be, build big tents and boxes for two weeks. But their notion of symbol and ritual in our capacity to understand that we have to, let me put it this way. Shomsky has a beautiful sentence that I would have loved to have said one day. He says, 
we don't believe in what we know. And that is so true. We all know that we can't keep going doing what we're doing. We all know that the climate has changed beyond repair, but we still don't believe it. And I think the power of architecture is the capacity to embody this understanding. All right, so after we stop talking about sustainable development, let's stop talking about public space. Public space is something that architects do when they don't know what to do anything else. It's just the void in front of the project or the void in the middle of the project. And it comes in places where public space is municipalized. If you live in Paris, like we do, public space isn't a challenge. It's given to you. It's given to you because they fought for it for, you know, a few centuries. But in most of the world, public space doesn't exist. You actually have to carve it. And one of the things that we do with the Lina in the office, and we make it a systemic dimension in every one of our projects, is we carve out publicness from the private realm. And I'm going to show a couple of projects that embody this. Um, we were asked to do a parking lot. This was an old market that wasn't used in the center of Rabat, the capital of Morocco. And in Morocco, the public spaces aren't squares. You know, it, it's not La Place des Vosges. Public space is in between. It's a uh, deambulatoire. It's places where you walk, right? You meet somebody in front of a train station, you walk down the boulevard, and you walk up the boulevard, you go into the little muse. There's no defined space for it. It's negotiated. And um, the, the big company that you see here with the shadow of its tower has asked us to build a parking uh, lot for them in here. And it just so happens that you're in between two of the main roads of the city and two secondary streets. What we did was very simple. We proposed to bury even further the, the parking and to create an open space that was one level below the street so we could carve out a commercial area to pay for the earth that we had to remove and also protect it from the street. Hopla. What we also just attached the plaza to two of the street that we made pedestrian. It seems a very simple choice. From a circulation point of view, it's a nightmare, obviously. And it created this. And it created a big worry. Because big open spaces like this, they don't like. Because it's places for demonstration. It's places for people to sell illegal things. It's, they don't like so much. So they won't put things in the middle. And we had conversations for months and months. What can we put here? Uh, we had, a, they wanted to put a clock tower. Um, His Majesty came to uh, New York during the winter and saw the Rockefeller Center and asked me to put here uh, uh, patinoire, how you say that? Uh, ice skating rink. It's not the choice. It's the notion that the void is a worry. And it's not just the officials. The, the people who are living around didn't know what to do, right? People were waiting for an inauguration. Like, when is it going to open? Even though it was finished for, uh, for months and months. And that's the big difference between doing urbanism and architecture. In architecture, you work with dimensions. With urbanism, you work with intensities. You don't really know how people are going to use things or whether it works. So it stayed empty for a long time. And little by little, you know, one kid's taking a skateboard and so on and so forth. And then one day there was a big music festival and they needed a big stage. And we were in Paris and they didn't tell us anything and this happened overnight. And obviously I called my insurance company because it wasn't um, dimensioned for this. But the fact that all of a sudden with a single event, a public space that's carved out of a private project becomes uh, accepted by the population. Another project where we carve out publicness in a very, very small lot, we're doing the cultural center of Morocco in Paris, Boulevard Saint-Michel. We're very proud of doing it because it's our first big commission in Paris. But the lot is uh, 30, 30 feet wide by 100 feet deep. So tiny, okay? But it just so happens that it's between the Boulevard Saint-Michel and a small street in the back. We didn't want to demonstrate Morocco as a culture. 
what we wanted to do is look at the intersection between the two cultures. What is it that we share? And here you have a, a street in Fez, and here you have a street in the fifth arrondissement in Paris. The culture of compression of the medieval fabric is the same. And that's how we started the project. So what we did out of this very tiny little project is a little medieval muse that you can cross, whether it's open or not. And it's not a single building. It becomes an aggregation of buildings that you can go through. It also allows, even though the space is very small, to be multiplied, where you're always suspended between an inside and outside and an inside and a street out on the other hand. And the complexity of such a stacking is made possible, obviously, by the fact that there's one thing that makes the city of Paris great, is that they don't allow you to do something that was already done. They consider that architecture should be of its time. And uh, they were very uh, good in helping us with this. This is the last theme I'm going to be talking about, and it's how we make cities. I'm still OK, Ben? All right. So the scary numbers first. In 20 years, we're going to have to build cities in the next 20 years for 3 billion people, 3 billion new urban people. That is one city of three million people every week. We would all love to be living in New York, Venice, Paris, Marrakesh, cities that took millennia or centuries to be built. We can't do it anymore. We're going to have to urbanize or find ways in which we can establish ourselves in the countryside at a much rapid pace. The problem is, as architects, we've stopped thinking about the future. I don't know when it happened. We were always meant to do this. And this prospective dimension of our profession not only is, has disappeared completely, but we carry it with a certain shame. Because from this, we got to that. So we, there's a certain weight we carry when we think about the future. The one thing that I want to advocate is that there's nobody else that can do it but us. We're the profession that thinks about human settlements. We're the profession that has the capacity to critically imagine the a future that will never exist. But by imagining it, it makes all the other futures possible. And there's the defi, the, the challenge that's ahead of us of building a city of three million people every week will have to push us to open up our boundaries of imagination. And we've been interested with the notion of the city for a little while, and we've been working with new cities, we're working with existing cities, half of what the office does is, is urbanism. And we understand that urban planning is a complicated thing, um, that it's, it's half between planification and uh, revolution. It's impossible to imagine, for example, the city of Paris between outside of Osman and La Commune. Whenever you plan, there's a pricing. And we try to position ourselves literally at the edge of planification and uprising. But there's two things that we advocate. is to make infrastructure visible and dimensioned. When you look at the contemporary sprawl, you think it's always been like this. But cities have only started sprawling for about 150 years. Right now, if you um, open the tap in your bathroom, you don't know where the water is coming from. There are cities, say Los Angeles, where the water comes from 600 miles away. The waste treatment the same way. The fact that the relationship between the infrastructure and the dimension has disappeared is profoundly problematic. What we're proposing is to make the infrastructure visible again instead of being buried. Right now, we don't know anything about how a city functions, and we don't even integrate it into the landscape. But that's also something quite new, from the aqueduct to the great uh, irrigation basins of the Menara to the pools of Hampi or even the wells of Venice. Infrastructure was part of the landscape. And by bringing back in, it recreates the notion that for each infrastructure, there's a dimensioned community that can manage it. So we've built a series of methods and models that allows us to imagine, not decide, how many people should live somewhere, but to look at a place and see what it can offer and therefore how many people can live there. 
The first project that we did this way was 20 years ago. It's a huge project. It's about two-thirds of the size of Manhattan. It's 5,000 hectares altogether. The incredible landscape. And what we did was very simple. There was nothing on it. And because the country is poor, you couldn't bring infrastructure. So we had to work with what's there. We looked at topography. We created dams. We protected the catchment area with greens. From that, we created a circulation network. We divided the entire series of plot into agrarian dimension so that the city becomes the slow colonization of countryside. And then we created moments of density in it as a series of villages. And all we could say is to arrive to the number that because there's a certain amount of water we could gather, 20 million liters a year, there's no more than 135, 162 people that could live there. The notion that it's not enclosed, but that the infrastructure is there, it will allow the amount of people that will live there. That creates, obviously, new kinds of landscape and new relationship uh, in our tribes and communities. I'm going to finish with a last project that's changed our relationship to cities. And it took us a little bit far. Again, I, I love to do this in France. You have to humor me. Do you recognize these two guys? No. Yeah, OK. So these two humanists met in Paris in 2007. Uh, Gaddafi came to buy a whole series of things in France. Um, things with sinister intent, radars and bombs and whatnot. But part of the deal, the French government uh, proposed to help Libya replan all of its cities. And it was a French uh, public institution called l'IEURIF, l'Institut d'Aménagement d'Urbanisme de la Région et de France, extraordinarily bright and learned urban planners who um, got the job. And they divided the country in three regions, Tripoli on one hand, Belgazi on the other, and all the desert. So they kept Tripoli and Benghazi, and they farmed out the desert to us. It was a fascinating job. We worked there for nearly four years, right before the revolution. And first thing to say that very few people know, Libya is an extraordinarily beautiful country, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. The entire desert is sitting on a freshwater lake. So there's oases popping everywhere. It's desert with water as much as you would want. Um, again, if we go back to the Romans, and that should be a, a mantra, I should go where all the Romans go because they can choose the site. They, they've been there quite a while. The thing with the desert in Libya is that it's not the southern border of Libya. It is the southern border of Europe. The reason why France proposed to plan this, it's because there's a billiard effect. You have people from the Darfur and Chad coming to Libya, Libyans coming to Italy, and from Italy coming to France. So there is a strong political agenda in urban planning in this particular dimension. The landscape is crazy beautiful, as I said. But Gaddafi, being the very stable and sane person that you know, had this idea in the early 90s of creating what he called the main man-made river. It was a river that would take water from the desert to the coast to irrigate the fields. The crazy notion with that, and I'll go back to this drawing one second, is that all the cities in the desert, and there are 50 villages, five medium-sized cities and one big city. All in all, about half a million people living, so not that many. The problem is, with a simple math, an eight-year-old could calculate that there's not enough water for all of these people in the next 40 years. So not all the cities will stay. We're going to have to aggregate cities. We're going to have to make cities disappear. The problem is we don't know how to do it, because urbanism as a discipline was created at the turn of the 20th century to help the growth of industrial cities. In this particular case, we had to invent a series of methods to give back a whole amount of artifacts and houses and streets back to nature and create large metropolis in the middle of desert. That happened right before the subprime crisis. But if you think about it, if you look at all these developments in suburbs that were never built, never finished, or never inhabited, this question of finding ways to give back large chunks 
of planned, poorly planned uh, urban territories to nature is something that we will all have to be looking at in the near future. Thank you. I mean, it, that is a consequence of the um, transformation of architecture into a financial product. You can, and that's very recent. Um, in the last 30 years, architects are not building any more pat patrimonies. They're building uh, financial assets, um, which one of the main reasons of the degradation of the uh, conditions of the practice. Wouldn't you agree, Ben? I actually want to uh, maybe start this by saying um, I really enjoyed your lecture um, and it was destabilizing, which I think it should have been because there's a mix of uh, healthy pessimism and also optimism um, in your approach and the approach to your practice. Um, and even some contradictions, right? Uh, contradiction of uh, or sort of criticism of sustainability and then of course you're involved in the uh, practice right of, of, of building such buildings um, but but my question is um, back to this kind of optimism optimism and pessimism has to do with your understanding or belief in the agency of the architect the power of the architect you've given architects a lot of responsibility in your um, in your talk, um, and I'm always trying to help uh, the public or the non-architectural public understand here that architects don't make all the decisions. In fact, uh, I think sometimes it's dangerous to think that architects make these decisions, right? Behind these buildings are developers and economic forces and so on. So I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about how uh, you feel that architects really, where is the role in terms of addressing these issues and, and how do they work with the other forces, those being economic, political, and so on? Um, because I don't think that architects always have as much power as you've, you've suggested. Um. I mean, it's a fantastically complicated questions, but l l let me answer in with two different ways. First, most of what we build, what architects build, isn't necessary. Most of construction should not be built. The, our job is less and less pertinent. So, well, yes, but no. Let, let me answer this question first. We've called our book Territories of Disobedience for a reason. Architecture has three prerogatives, and you're talking only about one, where we're stuck. We have a relationship to a client, we have a contract, we deliver documents, we get paid. That's fine. The second prerogative is that this client is paying us to do something for the community. So often, the agenda of the client and the agenda of the community, whom nobody told us what they wanted, but it's our job to make that call. It's not that there is somebody representing the tribe or the community telling us this is what it needs to happen, but it's our job to say that, is often in conflict with the, what the client is saying. And we have to organize this disobedience. We have to 
uh, be stronger in this power play. And there is nothing that we wouldn't do to get to our ultimate goal. The client is absolutely secondary to anything that we do. And it should be that way. Absolutely. And they enjoy every bit of it. But here's the third prerogative we talk even less about. As architects, we have to, comment dit témoigner? We have to, um, I'll say it in front, témoigner, testify for the living, not just for humans. We build for the flowers and the mosquitoes and the birds. Architecture is the relationship that we create with the ground. So, okay, there's a client who pays us, but we have to organize the relationship to the public and the relationship to, to, to the living. Now, how you do that is it warfare. It's blackmail. It's power play. And we don't talk about it because it's, it's ugly. It's sweaty, it's dirty, it's bloody. And um, most of architects try to esthetize this. And we don't because we know exactly what it is. It doesn't smell too good. But in order to do it, um, you need to know where you're going. So I never talk about the client, very rarely, because I don't think that what we do belongs to him. That being said, I st okay, but here's the thing. We, that's where architects are being not very interesting lately. Most of clients are happy with that. They want that adventure. They want to be part of something greater, which is why certain architects do very well because they're storytellers or they have charisma. But, but that's what the client is after. They're, they want to understand that what they do goes beyond what they do. Is that the good answer to your question? So th there, there are contradictions with this, but the one pride that we have with Lina is that at a moment where we had a choice of either surrendering to a commercial um, practice or to hide ourselves in an ivory tower in academia somewhere and building one house every three years, what we wanted to do is to actually have a practice where we build real things that actually are, have the capacity to change the territories and the life of people, for good and bad, we don't know, but uh, being just a critic on the sideline wasn't enough for us. And surrendering completely to the condition of the market is the reason why we're going at 200 miles an hour inside the wall. So when I say we have to change radically the way of doing it, I'm not saying everybody should do what we do, but that's how we're doing it. But you, you must see this, Ben, right? Yeah. Directing, I mean, do you, do you discuss much about the diminishing role of the architect? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's an absolute worry everywhere, right? But I don't feel like enough is being done to, it's, it's sort of a rear guard action. People are trying to kind of protect the few responsibilities we have, but we're not doing enough to actually expand that role again. We used to be important, and now you're just a tiny cog in the wheel. Can you, can, you talk, can you talk a little bit about uh, your personal views on history, both past and future, and architectural history, and how you, whether you value it or not? How, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it this way. Um, I worry about one thing. I'm a, I'm a historian. I, I, was, uh, I learned it and I teach it. My worry is as follows. We're seeing a trend where history has disappeared and geography has taken its place. Meaning, we're in the realm of architecture, we got into a form of solutionism where geography has taken over. For example, if it works here, then I'll be able to use it somewhere else. Whereas history isn't just the condition that allowed a certain typology to emerge. It's also how it's transforming on an everyday basis. So, I'm. I'm worried about the fact that history is either not understood or not used as a tool. Because that's, it's a, as architect, we use it, right? But we use it with certain uh, discernment, with certain, 
with, with caution. The risk is to start being samplers, that, you know, taking a little bit of this here because it works, a little bit of this here because it works, a bit, and take away the entire narrative that gives it uh, weight. So last way of asking, of answering this is, we want to be part of history. We want what we do to be part of a long chain. And for that, we need to understand the chain, which is why there's certain places where we don't work, because we don't understand the civilization or we don't understand the culture, and we would feel very hypercritical in doing it. Um, and in that sense, I think history is a limitation or should, be, should become again a limitation. I want to ask you because sometimes the best way of understanding somebody with a complex approach to incredibly smart individuals like yourself who are doing amazing work yet with this kind of disobedience which is I think um, something that many people come out of school uh, wanting to bring to their practice and then don't manage to keep that right because um, at the end of the day uh, if you manage to torture your clients and keep them you're lucky not everyone can can be as clever um, but other than uh, the great critic and historian Jean-Louis Cohen, who we both admire, who do you both admire? Or who do you admire in currently in history? Whose work and whose approach do you admire? That... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Use the mic. <laughs> Have you worked? Did you ever work for REM? I worked with REM on a few competitions. Uh-huh. So, so why? I really feel like he's defined architectural history for the past 20 years in all the events that he's... It's, it's been a school. I'm sorry. It's, it's been a school. He's... We were talking recently about the, the, uh, the, set, the number of degrees, right, between mm -hmm. people in architecture. With REM, I feel like everybody is within one or two degrees. Mm -hmm. Every but he in this room has been affected by him, mm -hmm. taught by him in, in an indirect or direct manner. Mm -hmm. And for some, it's for me, he stands out as being the, the historical architect, let's see, mm -hmm. of the generation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with that. And he, and he did something which is very important to, to us, is that he brings back the figure of the architect as an intellectual, not just as somebody who makes drawings or somebody who builds, but somebody who takes position on what society is and should be. That being said, he did as much good as bad, as much damage as anything else, mm -hmm. but he makes everybody else, uh, can you say dwarf-like? I mean, he's an immense figure. Mm -hmm. Even though nothing in what we do, uh, if anything, we sometimes define ourselves against that, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, um, and I think outside of him, I mean, I like the Mediterraneans, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, who I am. I think there's... In general. Some, well, I mean... Some, <laughs> or is there somebody we should know about? I'm fascinated by somebody like Rafael Moneo mm -hmm. because uh, of, A, the quality of his work, his consistency, uh, his involvement in academia, his capacity to shape an entire country's agenda on architecture. It's impossible to imagine the Spanish scene without uh, Rafa. Um, his teachings are incredible. And he has one sentence that I find fabulous. is, it, If you do a masterpiece, it has very little to do with you. It's an alignment of stars, of time, political moments, client, budget, what you had for lunch. It's an alignment of stars. If you try to do it too much, your buildings are going to be crap. So what you do is just have a very high standard of professionalism all the time, and eventually you'll do a couple masterpieces. And I think that's a perfect definition of what we should do. Yeah, that's a, a good note to uh, or maybe wrap up. Do we have one last one? I think you briefly answered it just by what you said right now, but um, I was curious about 
uh, your practice, like how you started, how you management, how you manage it, how you find clients, your relationship with governments, or you know, if you could talk a little bit about that because it is very uh, inspiring that you keep it. You seem to choose your clients very wisely, and um, and that's always something I admire. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. This is, this is the sausage making part, right? Yeah. Do we talk about it? Um, okay, a few things. First, she manages it, which is why we're still <laughs> afloat. Um, we're not a sm small practice. You know, with the, our office in Paris and office in Casablanca, we're a little over 30 people, and we manage uh, at any point anywhere between 20 to 22, 25 projects at a time. So when I show you the work here, um, it's, it's a very small portion of, of what we do, but it's a secret, and if they, please cut it uh, or yeah. edit it when in, in the mood, but I actually love the people I work with. I love my clients, and they know it. Most architects have only disdain for their client. A client is just somebody who's forcing them to do something, who doesn't want to pay them well, who's not as cultured as them. Uh, cultured as them. In the end, I, I love the human adventure of being with them. I love the moment of seduction and transformation, of mutual transformation, of making something together. And I'm very grateful uh, that they allow us to do what we do. And the reason why I think, when people ask me this question, uh, because we're not, we're, you know, we've been in practice for 15 years. We started very young. The reason why I think uh, people come back to work with us is because they generally are excited by the human adventure that we propose to them. We're not cheaters. We don't consider that there's something we say to them and something we say behind their back. We like to bring them as part of a complex uh, endeavor. And in the end, even though sometimes it goes through complicated and tense moments, because as you see, we have a very radical approach, it's even with them, um, they notice. There's a second part, is that there's a lot of projects that we invented ourselves. Most architects, they have commissions. Some of the projects you saw here are not commissions. The, the uh, expo in 2015, nobody called us and said, oh, we would love you to design this. We thought about it, we found the site, we raised the money, we f built the client body, uh, we created the regulations around it, we developed the scenography. There's one entire part of our office that's project engineering. We create, and that really is what defines us, we create the conditions in which we like to do our job. Whether the commission is here and we rewrite it, or the commission doesn't exist at all, and we tried to create it. And that be at first we did it because we had no work, right? So we had to make the work. But that became our way of doing things. We um, tried to expand the perimeter of what an architect does. And there's a real systemic process uh, between Lina and I of rewriting the conditions in which we do things. If we don't like it, then we don't fight it. We decide how we can change it, or we don't give up. And those two things, the fact that we like them and the fact that we often invent the conditions, is what I think makes this a little bit possible. So um, I'm going to say that we should continue to um, chat informally. Uh, we're here for about half an hour more, grab some wine, uh, talk to Lina and Tarek. I want to thank you for that um, fearless lecture. Um, <laughs> We don't always have everyone speaking that frankly here. Um, and I think it's really refreshing. And I do think that the disobedience is a, is a good uh, theme for you. Um, but I do really appreciate um, the healthy criticality, but optimism and forward thinking approach that you all have. So thank you for coming here to New York and sharing it with us. <laughs>